Hello, and welcome back to the show. First of all, I want to touch base on a couple of different things because uh, we'll get into the, the juicy content of the episode shortly, but it is coming closer to the end of the year. And generally I would open up applications for the mentorship in December for a January kickoff. However, this will be a little bit different next year. Um, not, not really different, but in a sense of when it's happening, it'll be more towards January, February opening up. I know December, January is quite like an odd, like it's a busy time. Your priorities are shifting. December, you're kind of like, woohoo, break. Um, and January, there's usually a lot of motivation around like, what am I even doing this year? Do I want to do this job still? Like have all these big goals now. And that's where people like sort of take a bit more action. Um, or you're on holidays still and you're not really getting back into work until February. So I have got a few things going on in December and January myself, uh, like outside of work. So I am going to be opening up the applications uh, closer to the end of January or beginning of February. I haven't got a solid date in place yet. I just have to sort out, finalize a few other things that I'm doing. Um, and then the applications will open. So it'll be another six month program. We're going to be going through all the pelvic, like pelvic health across the female lifespan. So we cover all the anatomy and physiology of the pelvic floor, pelvic floor dysfunctions. Uh, we look at exercise prescription and what that looks like from acute care all the way up into high intensity exercise. So we look at jumping, skipping, running. We look at heavy lifting, um, how to analyze hinges, how to learn, analyze squat movements. And then we go into sort of like the fate, the typical phases of pelvic health problems, shall we say. So we look at pregnancy um, and the, the relation to pelvic pelvic health. We look at postnatal rehab and returning back to exercise, whatever that might look like for someone. Um, and then we also look at the transition into menopause. We look at menstrual cycle health and also the role that pelvic health has in conditions such as like endometriosis and adenomyosis, things like that. So um, that is the program. It's a massive combination of group calls, one-on-one -on -one calls, uh, pre-recorded lessons, a lot of practical application and exercise workshops. It is a very thorough, in-depth program. And I will be sharing a lot more of it when the applications do open. So I am currently working on the back end of this because a few things are shifting in the education space for me for 2025, which is an exciting year and I hope that you all love it just as much as I do. But um, yeah, so I'll be sharing a little bit more about that. So if you're interested in it, I do have a wait list that has started already. Um, it is in the link in my bio on my Instagram page, but I shall pop it in the show notes as well. If you can't find it anywhere, please reach out and contact me. I know a few of you have actually already done that um, or you've joined the wait list and then you weren't quite sure if you were on it because email confirmations were lost somewhere in the midst of the uh, cyber world. Um, so if you're already on my email list, that kind of changes what confirmation emails that you get, which is an annoying back end of email marketing, shall we say, or um, well, the platform I use is an email marketing platform. Um, so yeah, I have started that wait list. There is only a small amount of um, spots available and 2025 is going to be a pretty different year um, for me and may not have as many positions open as I generally do. So I generally only take up to 10 people in that program. However, it might look different for 2025. So definitely join the waitlist if you're interested because I only open up the application to that first. And if the spots haven't been filled, then the wider population or community, shall we say, gets access to the application um, process. So yeah, join the waitlist if you're interested share more information with you later on, but that's a little bit of a quick insight. So today, speaking of women's health, today is about what is a women's health EP? How do you explain this to someone, um, especially if they're a client and they have no idea what you do, they're a practitioner and they have no idea what you do, or you're trying to meet with a GP and explain to them why they should refer to you over another clinician, which I'm sure many of you are feeling. So First thing is what I wanted to do was I actually wanted to put this into chat GPT live um, and see what it tells me. So if you're watching this on YouTube, you'll see me typing it in. Um, let's write here. What is, let's actually say, what is an exercise physiologist? Let's see what it says. Now um, I use chat GPT um, like randomly for um, like prompting, um, 
for like content development and like condensing things that I want to say in shorter sentences. Um, but, and then random stuff like this, <laughs> I'm like, read this to me. Um, so I don't really use it outside of that because I just don't, I'm not really a big fan of like AI in a sense of, um, creating everything and using it that well, but I also probably don't really know how to use it that well. Anyway, so an exercise physiologist, here we go. I'm reading this from ChatGPT, is a healthcare professional who specializes in understanding how physical activity affects the human body and uses this knowledge to design tailored exercise programs. They help people improve their health, fitness, and physical performance or manage chronic conditions through personalized exercise interventions. Exercise physiologists assess and apply exercise to support a wide range of needs, including improving cardiovascular fitness, increasing strength and mobility, managing pain, enhancing athletic performance, and addressing conditions like obesity, diabetes, heart disease, and more. In clinical settings, exercise physiologists also work with individuals recovering from injury or illness, often collaborating with other healthcare providers and can specialize in areas like cardiac rehab, women's health. Oh, it said women's health. That's crazy. Um, or chronic pain management. The expertise is grounded in science, often bridging the gap between medicine and physical training. That's actually not too bad. I'm, um, I like that that said women's health and I like that it said bridging the gap between medicine and physical training. Now, let's say, um, how, what does an exercise physiologist physiologist do in the women's health space let's see i also want it to like write a shorter answer so i might even say write a shorter answer in the women's health space an exercise physiologist targets um uses targeted exercise interventions to support health conditions unique to or more prevalent in women. They work with clients across different stages, such as puberty, preconception, pregnancy, postpartum, perimenopause, and menopause, and address issues like pelvic floor dysfunction, prolapse, endometriosis, polycystic ovarian syndrome, and osteoporosis. Their role often improves, and then it's gone into like five different areas um, with a bit of an explanation. So it says pelvic health management, pregnancy and postpartum care, menstrual and hormonal health, perimenopause and menopause, chronic pain, and mental health support. Um, so yeah, it's like done pretty good. Let, let's say what it says, what, how is an exercise physiologist different to a women's health physiotherapist, ph physiotherapist, sorry, <laughs> I'm like trying to type this at the same time. Ooh, this is interesting. An exercise physiologist and a women's health physiotherapist both play a central role in women's health, but they differ in their approaches, training, and treatment focus. Here's a closer look at the role. Scope and focus. Exercise physiologist primarily focuses on using exercise as a therapeutic tool to improve health, manage chronic conditions, and optimize physical performance. In women's health, they design specific exercise programs that support hormonal, pelvic, and reproductive health across the life stages. Women's health physiotherapist has a more hands-on approach, often involving manual therapy treat, to treat musculoskeletal, pelvic floor, and pain-related issues. Physiotherapists may use interventions like internal pelvic floor assessments, soft tissue work, joint mobilization, and biofeedback to support conditions such as incontinence, prolapse, pelvic pain, and recovery from surgeries. Talks about training and expertise. This is a huge response. I'm not even going to read all this out. It talks about training and expertise. Um, it says that exercise physiologists use a lot more exercise science for chronic disease management and focus on prescription and use exercise as a tool for preventative and rehabilitative purposes. Women's health physiotherapists are trained more in musculoskeletal assessment and manual therapy, um, and they're licensed to perform internal pelvic floor assessments and treatments where necessary. Treatment approach, movement, exercise rehab, long-term management for health for EPs, behavioral change, emphasize education and progressive exercise. Women's health physiotherapist looks more at hands-on skills, addressing more dysfunctional issues, um, manual manipulations, things like that. So, wow, I'm actually quite surprised. Um, I feel like I've done this before and, a, and the chat GP, the chat GPT and chat GPT came back with something very different to this. However, it also remembers a lot of things. And because I've used it quite a lot to talk about exercise physiology, I just wonder how much of it's like learning from what I'm teaching it um, about me. So yeah, random, random. I'm interested. I um, almost want to like copy and paste that whole thing and post it on my social media <laughs> or make like a, an email about it. Um, but anyway, if you want to look it up yourself, feel free to do that. I would, you know, you can just search that. Meanwhile, let's talk about how I pitch it um, and what I say. Um, firstly, 
I really want to talk about this because when it comes to women's health, um, it's been a, like a, a very big conversation inside the mentorship program and other people I've connected with about like feeling really lost as an EP because they don't really know where they fit within a physiotherapy, like within like compared to a physiotherapist as well as a personal trainer. And there's always this question around how can I explain what I do in the women's health setting when I'm either connecting with a GP and I'm trying to get them to refer to me because I feel like that's a really big barrier is why would, like when would you refer to a EP over a a physiotherapist in women's health? Um, But then also with other allied health professionals or even trying to explain to a physiotherapist in women's health or in general, when we could be referred to for women's health. So um, I wanted to talk about a bit about this because it's taken me a really long time to try and piece this together in my head. And I thought it would be really nice to share this to give you tools and strategies to go and use within your own workplace or your own career. Now, let's just break this down first of all into, I guess, exercise physiology in general. I I kind of see us initially as a physiologist. So understanding what is happening in the body at a more cellular level. That really also puts my headspace into the science side of things and like how we're really quite well equipped in like how the body actually works. So when I'm thinking back to when I was a personal trainer, I didn't know anything about this aside from how to lose weight and how to grow muscle. So I feel like that's something that really makes me think like I know a lot more about this Um, and this is what we initially do is learn about the cellular response to things about what's happening within the body and things we need to be aware of. Second to this is where I look at exercise as um, like we're professionals at exercise prescription and we are extremely, I want to say like maybe experts, let's call it experts actually rather than professionals, um, experts in exercise prescription. And we really understand how to use exercise in a prescriptive sense in order to create changes at the cellular level within the body. So we're looking at this to either improve symptoms, to increase functional capacity, and in some cases, even reverse health conditions. So I feel like when we look at it, we understand the cellular response, what's happening from a healthy population, conditions, um, every, any how anything is affecting the body. And then we understand exercise and understand like the type, the intensity, how much volume may be required to, I guess, create a cellular adaptation for an individual that may have some sort of condition going on. So we understand also then the role that exercise, like how that exercise can affect the cellular level and improve things and help the condition. But then we we also understand how that health condition can affect someone's ability to potentially partake in exercise. So it's kind of like a two-way pathway, I guess. So that's kind of like how I see an exercise physiologist. And that has really reshaped my, I guess, ability to see myself more as a clinician, health professional, um, expert, I guess you would say, rather than this, like, ah, I feel like I'm stuck in this like personal trainer world, which I was there for a really long time. And I know a lot of people can resonate with that, which is why I want to talk about that a lot today, because it doesn't, there's nothing worse than feeling like I've done all this study and I still feel like all I'm doing is training people in the gym. So if you are feeling like that right now, hopefully this episode helps you. Now, when I think we move into the women's health side of things, I think it becomes um, quite a lot of confusion and where where do we fit um, within that role? And I kind of see us working in two different settings for this. So I break it down into like the musculoskeletal side where we're assisting more with like pelvic floor dysfunction, injury, uh, pain management, even things like that. And this is where I feel like there's a lot of crossover in um, disciplines, which we'll get to later. But the other side of that is the health conditions that are related to cellular physiology that Um, isn't primarily a musculoskeletal concern. And this is where we're looking something more like endometriosis, polycystic ovarian syndrome, or any hormonal um, irregularity. We're looking at maybe reproductive health or fertility optimization or something along those lines, or even like the hormonal transitions that we would go through in life, um, something like menopause, for example, or even pregnancy related, um, I guess, health concerns that come about that aren't muscular. So I kind of pitch it in two. And I feel like the health condition side is a lot more, it's a lot easier to explain from that perspective. Um, When I think about the musk side of things, 
that is where there is so much crossover and it becomes really confusing. And I like to explain it to uh, mostly clients initially that we are practitioners in this space that take a movement-based approach to women's health. And we don't use manual therapy and we don't usually do, oh, we don't. We don't diagnose conditions. So generally someone already knows what they've got or the injury that they've had. Maybe they don't, but they're presenting with symptoms of things, but we're not diagnosing anything and we're not using any manual therapy. We're taking a movement-based approach. I think about it. I try and explain to them that we're just different. Just like an osteopath is different to a physiotherapist, there is also quite a lot of crossover between those two disciplines and people will just prefer to go to one over another. And generally when those clients don't get results from a particular discipline, they're going to go and try a different one. And if that person gets them results, they're generally then going to have a personal preference to that. So that when someone's talking to them about who to go see, they're going to recommend, oh, you should see an osteopath. They're really, really good at this. Or you should go and see a myotherapist because they do this really well. And I didn't really get any results from the other practitioner that I saw. So I really feel like um, there's, it's just different. Some will prefer one type of discipline over the other. Um, and I feel like this is quite similar for us in a sense of, uh, especially when we're considering women's health physiotherapy with exercise physiology, especially in those really early stages of interventions where their symptoms or their health concern, we're talking about musculoskeletal here, so it's usually pelvic floor issues, pelvic pain, pelvic dysfunction, um, when they're quite acute and um they're maybe seeking something other than maybe hands-on manual therapy that they're either not getting results from that or they don't like the manual therapy side of things and they're just trying like looking for another option. So I feel like that's where we can really get like confused about like what do we do and how can we refer over. Um, I also really feel like a big part of this just boils down to whether or not a client likes the practitioner and aligns with the values of the practitioner and resonates with the type of treatment methodology. So someone who really values movement and exercise is probably going to be more inclined to work with someone like an EP, whereas someone who doesn't really care about all that, doesn't have an exercise history, doesn't really care to do that, and maybe prefers more instant relief type manual therapy work is probably going to pref preference a physiotherapist over someone like us. The glory about being a manual therapist is that there's usually instantaneous changes that people feel where exercise requires a lot more buy-in and a lot more of a longer term approach because it takes a lot longer to feel those adaptations. Sometimes I wish we had a little bit of a quicker result, but unfortunately that's not what we do. Now, in the acute care, I feel like that's where we, uh, a lot of crossover, muscle, muscle retraining, really isolated work, things like that. Um, you know, aside from the manual therapy side of things, it's probably quite similar. Now, when I think about long-term care, this is where I feel like we really do fit in. And generally we're going to be bridging the gap between that acute care um, all the way to that solid exercise programming that is probably more targeted towards fitness-based goals and is less focused on managing the condition or symptoms of pain or dysfunction. So um, that is like that gap I guess that's more like personal training. I guess once they've got to that, like that would be an appropriate referral pathway if someone was to happily go and, you know, see a PT instead. Um, but generally I feel like we really understand how to get people off a table um, and integrate into functional movement patterns and then continue to strength train in order to increase someone's functional capacity so then they can go do fitness and health for other goals that aren't chronic disease management, if that makes sense. Um, it, well, not so much chronic disease, but I guess pelvic health dysfunction in the musk world. We're talking about the musk world here. Um, so I feel like um, that that is sort of like a really good explanation for me. That makes sense. And I feel like that's made sense to people I've told that to. Um, I know that there are also probably a lot of physios that listen to this and they're thinking like, yeah, we do that too. Like we know how to do that. But this is where I feel like it it actually really depends on the practitioner and the training level of that individual clinician. And typically I've not seen that progress progression done well. And if I have seen it done really well, it's been delivered by a practitioner that has really, really upskilled in the exercise programming side 
of their work or they have a really strong background as a personal trainer or they generally understand biomechanics really well. Maybe they do a lot of um, training themselves and they're more considered athletic people in general and they know a lot about progressive overload and what that looks like. Outside of that, clinicians who I've seen that have written exercise programs for pelvic health that seem to be a little bit further down the track from initial care is the progression is different. Um, The exercise choices are interesting from my perspective. Um, And I feel like there's a missing link between what levels of progression are actually appropriate and not. Um, And that's where I feel like it's just about the skill level of the clinician and not so much the the actual discipline because, you know, we can all upskill in different areas and become really quite good at things. So I feel like Um, this is all just a lot of my opinion and my clinical experience and what I've seen. Obviously, I'm also not seeing clients who haven't got results because generally they're not, they're no longer needing help. Um, so it is from my experience anyway, being that like middle block. Now I feel like, like I said earlier, it's really easy for us to explain a little bit more in terms of health conditions. So from that perspective, this is where there is less crossover, um, with the manual therapist, because, we are the professionals um, of knowing what type of exercise prescription is appropriate for a particular cellular adaptation that will improve symptoms or function or quality of life for someone with a health condition. So looking into the health conditions that are more specific for females is something that is not musculoskeletal based. So we're not looking at muscle function anymore. There'll be a component of that, but we're looking a lot more about exercise to target other body systems, and then adapting a program to fit within the world of that human. So how are we creating all of these like different cellular responses to help with that? So I um, feel like that's a little bit easier to explain (laughs) because health conditions versus like injury management, injury management, there's so much crossover. Health conditions are different. Um, It makes more sense from a practitioner. So usually you can sell it on that first if you're trying to explain it. Um, I have recently actually had a few meetings with general practitioners in the women's health space with a lot of intention to collaborate in certain women's health programs and build networks. And there's been a lot of confusion around when to refer to an EP. And this is something that I'm like, wow, this is actually a problem. Like they don't know. Um, And they're in women's health. So I'll give you a couple of examples that I've used so that maybe you can use them too, but um, I've got three here. So in the case of first one being prolapse management, I I talk about that I would work with a client to enhance their ability to exercise at higher loads without symptoms. This looks a lot like um, how to correctly squat, then progressively overloading that to a level that the pelvic floor can tolerate um, such that the movement itself is actually being supportive of pelvic floor strengthening and the prolapse, and they're not doing more damage or unable to do it with symptoms. Um, I also often think about it like, Um, I've taught this to the GPs about, so someone has a prolapse who is now moving into menopause and they're um, concerned about their bone health. How do we then get people to increase their exercise um, loading with bone specific loading exercises whilst improving or managing a prolapse? So like the barrier is the prolapse. They need to do these bone loading exercises. However, we can program appropriately so that we can get benefits for both of them. So that has been something that's really hit home with a couple of these practitioners that they have then reported back to me saying, oh, I'm actually thinking back to all these clients who have referred out for pessary use um, that could have really benefited from increasing their functional capacity within the system and not relying on a pessary. And I was like, yes, that is exactly when you should refer to me. Um, when they already know they have a prolapse as well, they were a bit concerned about diagnostics for that. So an assessment, especially also being online. Um, the second example that I use is a lot with the pelvic pain in the, or the endometriosis community. I feel like this is a really, really easy one to try and explain what you do. Um, I discuss how the role of exercise is important for total body inflammation, being that it's an inflammatory condition. Um, however, I also try and teach them that the wrong amount of exercise can really negatively contribute to this and be not tolerated and result in flare-ups uh, and eventually leads to a lot of deconditioning of the body which then obviously can create other health concerns for that person. So when we look at what an EP would do for someone with endometriosis, we're going to prescribe a tolerable level of exercise for that person based on an assessment. We're going to provide them with strategies for pain management. We're going to look at 
progression of that program appropriately so that the individual can then build more tolerance to higher levels of exercise for the purpose of then reducing inflammation, increasing their functional capacity, and then being able to move um, or improve other health markers that obviously come about from that sedentary lifestyle. I talk a lot about this population um, being unable to exercise for their general health and fitness and that their goal for us um, is to get them to the point that it isn't really managing about endometriosis anymore or pelvic pain, but it's actually about building health and fitness goals. I feel like that also resonates quite a lot because, you know, the GPs will talk to them about exercising and how that's really important for mental health and how it's important for inflammation, except the barrier is that the exercise tolerance is so low that they need to be able to build a tolerable level to then go and exercise. They're not able to work on getting towards running you know, running in a marathon or being able to do gym sessions and go to group classes. Like that's a lot of their goals. So when we talk about like, they can't get there because of this, we need to bridge that gap. This is what we do. And we work with exercise to create these physiological adaptations that help them tolerate this without the problems so that their general health can improve. That to me is like a really clear explanation of what an exercise physiologist does within women's health um, without that muscular component where they're, you know, they might be that would be an appropriate referral to a physio for internal release, but that is not going to solve their problems of not being able to exercise because the tolerance level isn't there. Really great one to start with if you're looking at, you know, getting into that community. Um, another example for more pelvic floor function is because I do a lot of that as well, is that I talk a lot about the missing pieces between pelvic floor specific exercise, like your Kegels. Um, and then looking at how the pelvic floor then fits within the rest of the body and has like functional thresholds. So someone, I get a lot of clients who report that they've seen a physiotherapist, they've done all the rehab for it. They have a grade five strength of function of their pelvic floor, but they still experience symptoms with leaking, um, sorry, experience symptoms of leaking in activities like running or after certain levels of intensity of exercise, or maybe they can't do um, the you know, certain amount of weight, lift heavy or skipping, something like that. Um, and they're still having all of these problems. Um, so this to me is where I explain that we look at assessing what their whole body is doing and how it is impacting their pelvic floor function. So we're looking at pressure management strategies. We're looking at muscular balance or functional movement strategies and patterns that that person is doing that may be contributing to poor loading through the pelvic floor. So the pelvic floor itself might not actually be the problem. It's actually uh, more about their strategies in movement and what they're actually doing that's contributing to this. What other muscle groups might need up training. Um, it might even just be the amount of volume that the program is and that they're not progressing the volume enough um, or correctly enough to increase their pelvic floor function in those exercises. Or I, I kind of refer to this as their like threshold of symptoms. So um, that's how I, I almost explain that to these other practitioners is that we're looking at when the pelvic floor therapy or rehab is done and they've still got all these problems, how do we integrate it all so that we've got people from doing acute pelvic floor specific exercises, but then feeding it into the rest of the body and its movement patterns, making sure that they're not loading incorrectly, that would then cause these symptoms. So um, I feel like that has also worked really well. So if you want to use those examples, um, you're more than welcome to. There are so many other ones that I've developed that have worked really well for me, but over time, I feel like this has only gotten a lot better at explaining because I really understand my role now and I felt very confused in that myself for a very long time and I really didn't really didn't know where I fit between the physio and the personal trainer um, or even what my role was in women's health when I wasn't getting referral pathways from that and I was just bringing clients naturally because of the work that I did and the the results that they were looking for or not getting from other services. So I still strongly believe that it's a certain service that people will preference and some people will not like it and they will prefer to go to other clinicians. And that is generally, I feel like I do the same thing when I'm looking for manual therapy. There's certain types of therapy that I would prefer to go to over others. And I probably would never go see some of the others because I don't resonate with them. And I think it's just the same. So remember, it just really boils down to the fact that we just do things a little bit differently. We're all working towards some sort of goal of helping the human or the person in front of us that with that condition or that problem. Um, and maybe the service fits their needs. Maybe it doesn't. But I, there's just a different way of going about doing it.
And I feel like that really helped me to understand that it's okay that someone wants to go see a different clinician because we all just do things differently and some get results in some ways and some don't. Um, so hopefully what I've shared with you today has been um, helpful for you to then go take away and use some of these examples in your work um, and how you communicate what you do. I would love for you to share anything outside of what I've already shared that resonates with you or that's really helped you. I think that um, collaborating over this and helping bring awareness to the role that we play within women's health or in general in health is really, really, really important. And I feel like a lot of people really struggle with how to explain our value um, and what we do and how we can really, really help people. So uh, hopefully we're continuing on this pathway of growing the reputation of exercise physiology. Um, I hope to be able to contribute to that role within women's health, especially by, um, you know, sharing this, um, hosting my podcast and sharing information about this so that people can access this and improve your own women's health understanding to then go treat clients and build a bit of a reputation about what you do within your community and the role of the exercise physiologist. So um, yeah, overarching goal is to make, women's health um you know be leaders within the women's health area um industry shall we say so yeah hopefully that hasn't like gone around in a million different ways and lost you halfway through that but if you're still here i'm guessing it hasn't so thank you again for listening now uh, i really again appreciate any shares uh if you're going to share this within your community that would be super helpful um otherwise yeah have a great day from wherever you are and i will see you in the next one